Well, good morning. Good morning. What a glorious day it is to be a child of God in Christ. Good morning. Well, it's good to see y'all once again. Uh, we're happy that we are going to uh, feast not only on the word. Uh, we have feasted on worship and song. Uh, later, we shall have our spiritual benefits as we also eat from the Lord's table. And then it won't be complete until we fellowship and eat with each other and break bread, which is one of the most common things that brought the saints together, especially in the early church. Something about breaking bread, uh, that great feast that we will enjoy in when we're in heaven. Um, I remember uh, when um, Kendra's uh, grandmother was close to passing to be on with the Lord, and she was in a nursing home. And um, I remember her words uh, where she stopped eating. She stopped, they would bring the food, and the food's not that great anyway, if you not understood how she cooked, okay? Because she was, she burned the kitchen up. It's really good. Well, I miss her uh, cooking. But now she's in a nursing home where the food's not that good, but she would eat it, but she stopped eating. And the nurse told us that basically she said that, um, she said, I'm not going to eat another thing until I eat at the table with my Jesus. Not another thing. And she passed shortly after. And I think in that wise sorrow that she is gone, she left us hope of a greater feast, a greater fellowship to come. We shall continue. Uh, as I mentioned last week, we spent some time talking about in Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 23 is the, the text we've been focusing on since last week. And we'll finish it this week as we focus in on verses 20 through 23 as Jesus starts to lean in a little bit more specifically. Because remember, they accuse him of, of casting out demons by the power of Satan, the prince of demons, Beelzebub. And he spotlights, he highlights their hypocrisy and their duplicity in making such a statement because it's ridiculous what they're saying. But we talked about a lot of those different things, some of the root reasons why the, those things are. But now he leans in even more uh, in terms of uh, the reasons for his response to their accusations. And so last week, we explored three questions as we looked mostly at verses 14 through 19. We explored how we should understand the allegations that were made by some that Jesus cast out demons by the power of Satan and how he spotlights the absurd, absurdity of their accusations that Satan is divided against himself in his mission to destroy the works of God and his people. And then likewise, we took the opportunity to talk about how division destroys the fellowship of the saints. We also talked about a second question. What were some of their root reasons for their deep-seated hatred for Jesus? Because there's reason for that. You know, we know just even in our common relationships, when we have issues with people, if what comes out of our mouths that that person is in league with the devil, what that does is that reveals some deep-seated issues with us. Now, we may have a good reason for saying that, but there isn't love when we say that. There isn't love. And so we talked about the fact that they were jealous of his fame, right? Because his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee and the surrounding areas. We talked about that they resented his claim that he was the son of God. They resented this. Uh, he also did not honor their traditions and their feasts. Why? Because they held them in a hypocritical way. And they esteemed their traditions higher than the commands of God. And then I think most important probably the primary reason why they despise him is because he associated with undesirables, with sinners. He was seen fraternizing with prostitutes and tax collectors and fishermen were his disciples that he collected to himself. This is, does not esteem him in their eyes. So we talked about there's some reasons for these things. And we also talked about what are some ways in light of what we learned last week, what are some ways that we can imitate Jesus' disposition and works in the face of persecution, in the face of slander, in the face of reviling? Because Jesus said that these things is not a matter of, you know, if, but when they happen. They're going to happen. Okay, and that we are to rejoice in these things when we are reviled, we are set aside, we are cast out, we are ostracized for his name's sake, for his name's sake. So we talked about that. Uh, so we talked about how do we imitate Jesus in his way. So we do what Jesus did. Number one, we labor for the glory of God. 
that everything that we do is unto God. We don't labor for men, we labor for God. And when you and I put our focus on God and our labor and not on people, God uses us to labor for people, if that makes sense. I, we focus on people and God will focus on God and God will focus on people through us, through us. We also talked about the fact that, you know, that one of the things that would help us to imitate Jesus is that we should resist the temptation to divide over non-essential matters. Non-essential matters. We talked about that. And we also talked about the importance when you look at Jesus' life and his gospel ministry, the importance of associating and creating bridges to the laws or simply just people different from us. Because sometimes we got walls between ourselves as Christians. You know, if they're not like us, not from my same tribe, not from my same, all these different things, we create up this wall, it's us against them. Okay, but the importance that Jesus endeavored to be with people of all sorts, of all kinds. So we talked about those things. And so I'm gonna, we're going to read now uh, from our focus text, and I'm going to start all the way from the beginning, uh, Luke chapter 11, verses 14 uh, through 20. If you have your Bible, you can read with me. In verse 14, it says, Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, while others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub, and that if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him, overcomes him, and takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have reached down from heaven to solve the eternal problem, the primary problem we have in creation, that we're fallen. And that through your son, Jesus Christ, that you have restored human dignity to us as your chosen children. We pray of it, Father Lord, that we not only ponder at the great gifts you've given us through Jesus Christ, but that you help us to realize and understand the kingdom that came with your son. That he was a preview, the first fruits of the kingdom to come, not only to come, but that is present now left to us to be its soldiers, to take on and advance the kingdom in this world until Jesus comes again to bring a full fulfillment of not only the kingdom, but to reveal the sons of God that we all are. So we pray, Father, that you would help us as we go through your word to embrace this truth, to understand it, to live it. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this week we'll, we'll focus on the last couple verses as Jesus gets into the strong man teaching. We'll explore the impact of Jesus' kingdom on Satan's empire. And so we should learn how we should understand this teaching about the strong man as it relates to Jesus' overthrow of Satan's power and authority. And so remember last week, I quoted for y'all a specific text in the Bible that is really the theme and concept of not only this teaching, but as we think about how we are to live for God going forward. You remember, Paul says that the kingdom of God is not just a matter of talk, but a display of his power, a display of his power. Remember, Jesus didn't just simply say that I am the son of God. He went about being the son of God. Remember, the signs and wonders were the purpose of them were validating truths of who Jesus was. That's why often the Pharisees, scribes, and religious elite were frustrated because they could not deny. Because he not only said it, but he did it. But he did it. 
And so we also see uh, in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus teaches the disciples to pray, which Pastor Preston worked through wonderfully over a couple of weeks. If you need to see that again, you can go on our Facebook page and review those sermons again. But he went through the Lord's Prayer wonderfully. But you see, even in the Lord's Prayer, there is a kingdom mindset in which Jesus is imparting to them. Because remember, you know, they had prayer in their life, but they noticed something was different from G- for Jesus. They also noticed that Jesus went off almost every evening to pray and be with God alone. And so it's not by mistake that they look at him and say, Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us to pray how you pray, how to pray. And everything that Jesus spoke and did was administering the kingdom to them. And so uh, that's the reason why when the disciples are taught to pray in such a way, it would enable them, and that's also us, to be these reflectors like mirrors of the kingdom of God. That's the purpose of everything that Jesus did. And through his prayer, it highlights highlights that the uh, the kingdom uh, that manifests not only with our relationship with God, but with other people. That's when the kingdom shines, our relationship with God and then with other people, right? And so he tells us to follow, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. We are to acknowledge God's authority over us and our focus is his will and kingdom be reflected in us. We're asking God for the kingdom to come live through us every day. He said, give us each day our daily bread. We acknowledge our neediness and express our desire to be dependent on God. We desire, and that's hard because we're taught in this world to be dependent on ourselves. You know, if you grow up in any family, I've been told that, I live my life like that most of the time where if Jason doesn't do it, it's not going to get done because I can't depend on people. That is until I came into the kingdom. As I became a saint, and I realized the fallacy of such way of thinking, but that is a concept that we're taught to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do these various things. And when we come into the kingdom and we have to be dependent on God, that becomes a problem, especially if God is moving too slow for us or we didn't get the answer in the way that we liked. We liked And so a kingdom mindset acknowledges our neediness and expresses our desire before God that we are in constant need, not in Every now and then, we're in constant need of God. That is kingdom thinking. And forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. As forgiven sinners, we are called to extend the same grace to us. Because remember, the kingdom of God, remember Jesus said, it is God's pleasure to give you the kingdom. See, the kingdom is a gift that we receive, not merit. And so what do you do with a gift? You give it to others. Give freely as you have received. That is kingdom thinking. And then he says, and lead us not into temptation. We acknowledge that we need God to help us to live holy. And why is that important? Because without holiness, is what the Bible says, no one shall see God living in us. So when you see the Lord's prayers, he's teaching just an example of many of his teachings. What you see is that Jesus places God at the center of our lives, thus positioning us to bear the fruits of the kingdom. So in essence, if I look at the Lord's prayer, in essence, his prayer instructions could be summed up in one statement in the scriptures in Matthew 6, 33, when Jesus told them, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. Seek ye first. And so he teaches in the Lord's prayer. And now we see this act of the power of the kingdom where Jesus cast out a demon out of a man who deprived him of the power of speech. So we talked about last week. And in response to such encroachment on Satan's domain, he uses people to slander Jesus, to discredit him, to distort the undeniable witness of God's work as they accuse him. And so this week, we will further explore those accusations. As Jesus now highlights the present reality of the kingdom, a kingdom that lays siege, that tears down the walls, that takes power and captures the goods of Satan's fortress. That's the kingdom that he highlights. So let us begin. So Jesus exposes the duplicity of the accusations. Again, he casts out demons by Beelzebub. So on one hand, they, the religious leaders and the Jews, approved of their own followers who cast out demons. But when Jesus does it, it's Satan's work. Right. It's Satan's work. 
And Jesus like, is Satan divided? And Jesus understood that even their own followers, their own followers could see the glaring double standard of the position. This is why he tells them. He says, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. They will be your judges. And how will, king, how will Satan's kingdom stand if he works against himself? He's not going to deplore the very God who has come to destroy his work and take back what belongs to him. He's not going to do that. How will king, Satan's kingdom stand if he works against himself? And most importantly, Jesus understood that there was strength in unity. There's strength in unity. That's why he says, for a house divided cannot stand. That's why we talked a little bit last week while we're on the, on the subject of division, how division and discord negatively impacts the church. He understood that there's strength in unity. And even the devil is not divided against his own labors in their joint effort to destroy the works of God and his chosen people. We always have to remember what the Bible says is that Satan is the arch enemy of God that ancient serpent. So we have to remember that. And so Jesus, he says these words. He says that, uh, he says, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The finger of God. And so when you see that type of term term in the Bible, the finger of God is a way of describing the works of God. And what works of God did we see that, that they see on display with this mute man? As recorded in the text, they see one of Satan's soldiers, that is a demon, was uprooted from his stronghold. That is, possession of a human soul. He was uprooted and thus had his enslaving mission ended. That was a manifestation of the kingdom of God. What they witnessed was a preview and a demonstration of the power of God's kingdom. Which is why Jesus responds to that accusation. He says, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God has come upon you. And remember, when Jesus started his gospel ministry, he boldly proclaimed the presence of the kingdom of God was here now. He says, you look at all these scriptures, he says, but they all speak of me. They all speak of me. And he said, you're not going to look over here and say, there, there's the kingdom of God. He said, because the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. I am standing right here. I am standing right here. And so through Jesus, the kingdom is not simply waiting in heaven in some all distant place for our disembodied souls to go, but rather it, is come, rather it has now come down in the present and will be fully revealed at the return of Christ. So in the healing of the mute man, the crowds had witnessed the royal dominion of God manifesting itself in power and grace. And so now Jesus began to lean in because, see, there's a greater work that he came to do in the kingdom. And so he begins to transition uh, into talking about what this strong man is. And so the kingdom of God impacts us in two primary ways. There are present needs, right? Things we need now in the earth to live. And we see this in Jesus' gospel ministry. And then there is an eternal need. And so Let's talk about the present. So Jesus came preaching the word of truth, casting out demons and healing the sick. OK. And so even when we see, for example, when he does the miracle of the loaves and the fish. Right. And in one of the Gospels, you know, he is there being the bread of life, feeding them the word of God for days, for days. But then the Bible says that he turns to his disciples and he says, you know, what are we going to feed these people? He said, because they've been here with us for days, and I'm concerned that if we send them away like this, they'll faint along the way they're going. So he was also concerned about their physical needs, physical needs. And so there are some present things that Jesus was working in. You know, now the key is the present things are only temporary. You know, right? So like in John 11, we talked about that last week. He rose Lazarus from the dead. Now, that was a powerful miracle that, that spoke to Jesus, the Son of God, and, and it was a gift and a relief to Lazarus' sisters, that they brothers were restored to them for a temporary amount of time. But it was also temporary because, like the rest of us, Lazarus still had to die. Okay? He still had to die. And so Jesus came preaching the word of truth, casting out demons, healing the sick. 
His truth sets us free from carnal and sinful thinking. And the presence, the presence of his spirit evicted the controlling presence of demonic forces within us. And our adoption into God's family restores dignity of God to us as his image bearers. So this is why Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17, he says that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him, glorified with him. And even Jesus came and he spoke about his mission. So you remember in Luke's gospel, he goes back into his hometown of Nazareth. He goes in the synagogue and the Bible says he stands up and he opens the scrolls of Isaiah. And he begins to read a prophecy about himself. But in that prophecy, it speaks of the works that he came to do that affects us both in the present and eternally. So in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 19, he gets up and reads and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, both present and eternal. Now, through Christ, we shall experience an appetizer of his promises in the present, but we must understand that his mission's primary objective was eternal in nature. That was his primary objective. And so the gospel itself puts on display a king and a kingdom. It puts on display a king and a kingdom. Where through salvation, we in Jesus, we are given a foretaste of the great feast in the new creation to come. And as I've said earlier, Jesus cared deeply. He cares deeply about our earthly needs. He cares deeply. And we see this again in his gospel ministry life. However, we, he came to deal with a much greater problem. A much greater problem. Okay, And that greater problem is simply is this. That we were denied access to the Father and the kingdom. Why? Because Satan had the power of sin and death. And so Jesus is the Father's response to this dilemma. He is the Father's response to this dilemma. Dilemma. So in our focus text, Jesus describes Satan as the strong man, as the strong man who has control of his own house, or as some English translators said, his own palace. Okay? He says, when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe. Satan is the strong man, has control of his own house. That is, demons, non-believers, sin and death, all this crazy mess is in his fortress that he has control over. The souls, also the souls of men who he infests and possess with demons. Satan has control of all these things. That is until one stronger comes. One stronger comes. And see, Jesus, what he's telling us here is that Jesus is the stronger one who deals with our internal dilemma by launching a spiritual offensive against Satan's fortress of security in which he trusted. See, remember, the kingdom of God does not have a defensive posture, just so you know. It is an offense. It presses in to take and capture the domain of Satan that does not belong to him. It's offensive in nature. And so Jesus is the stronger one who deals with our internal dilemma. Launching a spiritual offensive against Satan's fortress of security, in which he trusted. This is why Jesus says that when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he, look at these words, attacks him and overcomes him and takes away his armor, which he trusts, and divides the spoils. Now, how did Jesus do this? He did this in two places. Number one, he broke the power of sin on the cross by our atonement for sin forever, forever. And number two, he defeated death by his resurrection, by rising from the grave. And so he came down and he shared in our humanity, yet without sin, that through his redemptive works, the devil could no longer stand in the way of our access to life and liberty to God. He can no longer. 
This is why in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, they say, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those through the fear of death who were subject to lifelong slavery. Lifelong slavery. And this is the reason why Paul, when you read 1 Corinthians 15, he talks a lot about the new creation and glorified bodies and all these promises to come. And we read this uh, in verses 50, 56 through 57, that Paul says, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this armor, which Satan secures himself, is stripped of him by God. And the human souls that he held captive are taken as the spoils of war. Taken as the spoils of war. This is the kind of imagery that Jesus has given us. Taken as the spoils of war. And what does God do with these goods that he has stripped from Satan? What does he do? And see, it's through salvation he does a couple things. He takes those goods, which is us, hid behind Satan's fortress. Jesus has come and taken them. And what he's done is that he has made us new. He has repurposed us and distributed us to the world. It's kind of like every time I read this, I think of uh, the, the movie Robin Hood. Okay. And he's got himself and his band of thieves and whatnot. But the objective is to go into uh, this despot's castle who rules with evil and wickedness, who robs people of their possessions and poor, and he sits fattened on all his wealth, and they go into the fortress, and they take all the goods, and you see them just casting these goods and stuff out to the people, redistributing it to the people for their goods, possessions that they have taken for themselves from the people. And so when you think about what God has done, he's not given us something that belongs to us, he's taken what belongs to him, and he has made us new. He is repurposed us and he distributes us as gifts to the world. Gifts to the world. Why? He distributes us as gifts to the world so that we may testify to the works that Christ has done in our lives, freeing us from the kingdom of Satan. From the kingdom of Satan. This is why Paul says to in Colossians chapter 1. Verses 13 through 14, he says that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We become gifts to the world because we bring with us the good news, the good news that salvation is ours through Christ. It is almost as if the heavenly father before Jesus comes as born into the earth he looks at his son and he says to him, it is time. Go get my children. Go get what belongs to me. And then Jesus, Emmanuel with us, was born. Was born as he pierced the darkness, as he invaded Satan's territory and began to take power and control. And so in conclusion, well, that's a wonderful word right now, in conclusion, okay, Remember, I always say that the kingdom of God is not a matter of helpful teaching and making nicer people. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. He said, but it has all power to overcome the kingdom of Satan. And this is why Paul, without apology, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. I am unashamed. This is the reason why Paul was willing to go through heaven and earth to ensure that the church spread and the kingdom works be done. Because remember, God is coming. Jesus is coming back and he's going to make everything new and everything that you and I do here in the earth for the kingdom matters and will stand and will stand. And so we should not have this kind of escapism kind of mentality where we're just going to fold our hands and we're just going to wait for the Lord back and he's just going to bleak us off to some new destination up here. No, he is making all things here in the earth new, new. And so that's the reason why when we pray to God, we're praying for his kingdom to come live in us. Our father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it were is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That is our prayer every day. We pray for the kingdom to come, that it will shine through us to the glory of God. And how is this all possible? Because Jesus is the stronger one. He is the stronger one. He has not only come to proclaim the kingdom of God through salvation, but one day he will return and complete the work once and for all. He will take hold of Satan and his empire and cast him out into the lake of fire for all eternity. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have fought the battle that we cannot fight. That you came and you were perfect. That you may die for our sins. And that you conquered death. So now not only do we die with you in our old life on the cross, but we're raised to new life in you. And so, Lord, we help us, Heavenly Father, to live in such a way with the resurrection living in our heart. That everyone that we speak to, everything we do is for the glory of God, because one day you will return. But not only do you return, but we also know and understand that you are with us. You're not just in heaven, but you sent your spirit to be present with us always. That even though in our thoughts and our feelings, sometimes we don't feel like you're close. Sometimes we feel like that you don't answer our prayers. But help us to reach beyond how, I, how we feel and embrace the truth of what your Bible says, what we know to be true. That you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us that you're preparing a place for us and you will return again. And that you've given us everything we need to continue in the gospel works until you return. We pray this prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to enter a time of practice peace where we take communion together. Practice peace is um, it's a rhythm we've worked into our service so that we have time to meditate and reflect upon God's grace to us, his mercy and the mystery of, of his kingdom. Part of the kingdom is here with us now. There's more to come fully. And the meal right here is a portion of his presence with us, his kingdom. Now, the early church did not have a Bible. They didn't have a book bound to open it and read it. For a thousand years, they didn't have a book. We, uh, we often forget that. And so the early church, they told each other the story. It was an oral tradition that was handed down to them by the disciples. They couldn't turn to page so-and-so and read about the Last Supper. But they could share a meal. And they knew what the symbols of those meal pieces meant. You think about that. They didn't have a book called the Bible. They just had each other and the words that they were taught. That's why it's important that we teach our children 
Because one day somebody's going to take our Bibles like they do in other parts of the world. So this is a great time to confess. Confess.